Good morning. It's Thursday morning and time for devotions. Um, as we're closing in on the weekend, I just want to remind folks we are having our early service again. Uh, that starts at 9 o'clock instead of 8.15, which it used to start at. I think I've been saying 8.30, but it actually started at 8.15 and ended at 9. We're starting at 9, and uh, then we'll have the 10.30 service. And in between, and actually at 9, uh, coffee and, and uh, juice and stuff will be ready downstairs so that we can have some fellowship time both between the two services and after the second service. So we invite you to come and to be a part of that. All are surely welcome. Um, again, today we're going to be looking at the church for others. And I would invite you to join with me in prayer as we enter into this time. Lord Jesus Christ, pour out your spirit upon your church so that she may faithfully and constantly serve you and your children. In the name of Christ, amen. The, the reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 through 23. And this is a continuation of um, Paul's claims to his own uh, area of ministry, which God has called him to and ordained him in. And uh, if you've uh, if you read a lot of Paul's stuff, uh, you you recognize the fact that. Um, and and again, I'll I'll take it back one notch. His he had people who were following after him and were claiming that he had no right to say what he said that he was wrong and they were right and that you had to become a Jew first before you could become a Christian. And, uh, and so Christianity was exclusively for Jews. And, uh, and so this created worlds of havoc in these places where Paul had gone and under God's authority begun the process of, uh, of not just bringing people to Christ, but building a church of people who had come to Christ. And so, uh, as as he's you know goes back or is talking to them, having heard that other people come through and said these things, you know, Paul is is saying, okay, they said they have more authority than me. Uh, the fact is, they don't have any authority. They're not called to this. This is what God has called me to do, and I'm doing it. And if they tell you you have to become a Jew first, no, they're wrong. And uh, and so. Uh, any any time you have that kind of a squabble, if you will, going on, and it was more than just a squabble for sure, it was a uh, uh, it really was ultimately an undermining of the gospel. It was a destruction of what God intended to do in the Gentile world. Um, but it uh, it had massive political implications, obviously, in terms of that was where the source was. He's wrong, we're right, we'll tell you how to get to heaven, and he can't. And then Paul was saying, um, you know, their their whole premise is wrong. And uh, I have been called to this ministry, and you need to hear what it is that I'm saying to you. So he goes on and he begins to talk about himself and uh, his call and his authority, and he's claiming those things that God has uh, has laid upon him as responsibilities, he you know, and he's claiming those things, and um, and the other people were you know were at were demanding um, various sorts of gifts and offerings uh, to continue their work, whereas Paul, in in almost all of his initial work, at least um, in an area, um, he went as a tent maker, and he was working. Uh, and did not demand anything of anyone. Now, once he left, he would encourage the uh, communities that he had left to send gifts to the Christians in uh, back in Jerusalem, who were already being very persecuted by the uh, political structure in Jerusalem by the Jews. And, uh, and, and soon the Romans would turn their attention on them, and that would be uh, even more oppression. But for the most part, Paul was not going around uh, collecting money for anything, you know, uh, for himself in particular, initially, and when he entered into an area. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 15 through 23. 
Uh, and he's talked about the fact he has a right, because of what he's been called to do, to demand certain things. But he says, I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jew I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. May God add his blessing indeed to the reading from his word. So, you know, it's a little weird. Uh, Paul is very wordy and um, unlike me, you know. But anyway, Paul tends to be pretty wordy, and sometimes you have to sort of sit back and read something ten times, and you still sort of have some puzzles over it. I think that rather than, you know, than really nail it down and try to address every single statement that he makes in here, I, I would rather uh, generalize it for us, because some of the things that are there are really beyond our understanding, because they reflect things that we don't have an understanding about. Um the, the connection to the law, for example, we, we are not Jewish. We don't have a solid sense of the law um, that uh, they did have a solid sense of. So, again, um, there are things in this that, you know, are confusing to you and, and I, uh, for sure. But let's look at the kind of the premise that he's working under. I think one of the places that really hit me was... Um, when he uh, is, is talking about, um, at the very beginning, uh, I'm writing this so, I'm not writing this so that the rights that I would have may be applied in my case. Indeed, I'd rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. And, and so we have this setup. Okay, so he, he's saying this is the thing that honors me. The way that I approach this is the thing that brings me joy brings me honor, and uh, and makes me different than some of the other people who are coming around. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, uh, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. So he's he, he's here identifying the fact that he, God has said, you will do this, and he said, okay, I will. Um, and that's no, that's no commentary on Paul uh, or his authority or anything else. Well, it is a commentary on his authority because God told him, told him to do it. But he, he could either be disobedient to God or he could do it. And, um, and he's going to be obedient to God. So he does it. Um, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. So in other words, this wasn't my idea. You know, if it was my idea, well, good for me. You know, there ought to be some kind of reward in it for me, right? But it was a commission from God. Therefore, uh, it has nothing to do with what he's doing with the people. He is doing it unto God. It, you know, God is the one who has commanded it. So it's a commission from God. He's being obedient to God. His focus is following God. And uh, what then is my reward? So it's, in, in, again, in a, in a non-slavery-oriented uh, society, it's hard for us to pick up on this, but um, a servant was responsible to the master exclusively to do what the master told them to do. And they might do a good thing for someone, but it didn't reflect on them at all. It reflected back on the master. Same thing for us. You know, again, it's about our relationship with God. 
how we reach out to others comes out of our relationship with God and God's command to us. And, you know, I think one of the, one of the biggest mistakes that we have made is, is uh, having a perception that somehow being a Christian makes us a nice person and therefore we're nicer to people. And, uh, and well, you know, yeah, we ought to be for sure. But the point is, what we offer to others and uh, our love and, and loving response to others comes out of our relationship with God. It isn't something we pull up out of ourselves. It isn't because we're nicer than everyone else. It's because we're in relation with God and he has given us this responsibility. And that's why Paul says, you know, it's a commission. What I have, if I chose to do this out of my own free will and everything was fine and dandy and I, you know, I could do anything I wanted and I chose to do this, well, I'd get a reward. I would deserve a reward. You would owe me, okay? Because I'm doing it for you, so you would owe me. But instead he says, but that's not how it is. I'm doing it because I have a commission from God. Therefore, it's between me and God. And any reward you might give me um, is, is somewhat irrelevant in comparison to the fact that I have something coming from God. Uh, and so he, because he has received this from God, this, this commission, because he has received this salvation, he goes out and he makes the gospel free of charge because indeed it was ultimately free of charge to him. And he chose it and he chose to be responsible to God and he chose to be a servant of God. And so his responsibility is to make the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation, the good news of eternal life, to make that available to people, the knowledge of that uh, po possibility in their life, to make it available to them free of charge. And, uh, and, and, and because of that, he doesn't have, uh, although he certainly could have rights, if you will, you know, I got my rights. He doesn't have to make use of them because it's not about ultimately, ultimately, it's not about his relationship with them. It's about his relationship with God. And, and so he uh, uh, he goes down through this list, you know, so I became like a Jew for the Jews. I became uh, uh, like a someone who's under the law to those who are under the law. I became weak to those who are weak. Uh, you know, and he goes on and on about all these different things where he tries he, he plugs himself into the situation and the station of, uh, of other people to the best of his ability. And he does that in order so that he might be able to reach them. But he does it, again, primarily for God. That's, you know, that's his call, is to reach out to everyone that he possibly can in any way that he possibly can. And, and he ends it up, so again, I'm not gonna deal with those individual things, but I am gonna come down to the end and say, um, you know, uh, that I might by all means save some. The means that are available to him in his connection with God. And, and you know, one of the interesting things that you see about God is, is God uh, often gives prophets uh, and, uh, and even when Satan goes to him in, uh, in the book of Job, okay, God gives limits. He says, you can do this, no more. You can do that, no more. You know, this is, this is the limit of what, what I'm going to allow you to do. And, uh, and so all the means that are available to him, Paul says he's going to use. All the things that God will allow he is going to use so that some people might be saved. Again, there's a point here, too, that you don't want to miss, and that is that not everybody, I use all means that some might be saved. Not everybody's going to receive this. Not everyone is going to accept the gospel. Not everyone is going to be saved. But our responsibility to God is to reach out with the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation, the good news of eternal life, to everyone that we can. And uh, that's our responsibility. And we do it 
not even so much to save their souls, but so that uh, we are obedient to God. That's the first line of effort on our part is to be obedient to God. We get to share in the joy, uh, the unmitigated joy of someone who comes to the Lord. But uh, if if it was up to uh, if it was up to me to find all the joy in my life by the number of people that I have brought to Jesus, um, I would I would be very sad very quickly. You know, if I didn't get two or three people a day, um, I would figure I was failing. But I'm there to serve God, and uh, and I do get enough of that connection, if you will, of that joy from those things. God shares that with me, but it is his joy to share um, that it is in tremendously encouraging to me in, in what I'm doing or what I'm attempting to do because I'm doing it for him. And other times wherein, you know, you can see that you have, you've really str uh, striven to be the person God is calling you to be and, uh, and there is no response. And, you know, again, that would just be devastating if that was your whole goal. But the point is, you don't even know what it is ultimately that you have done or that you have reached or that you have changed in another person because um, uh, the, the change may not take effect in your knowledge of that person, start to finish. May not take effect in your lifetime. But there may come a moment when God resurrects the, the seed that you have planted in someone as they sit on the verge of death, and, uh, and they may enter into the, the gospel joy uh, because of something that you've said or done. And, uh, and, and again, you get to share that joy that is God's joy. And it's not something you have to suck up out of your own life or out of your own efforts or out of your own successes and failures, if you will. So, you know, what Paul has to say here is really important for us to, uh, to listen to, to pay attention to. Because, folks, we're, we're engaged in a time in history where there is such a broad, wide rejection of anything that smacks of God, anything that smacks of any of God's desires for us, which sometimes we define as morality uh, or as, as Christian legalism. Um, you know, we can define those things, and in defining them, we attach a evaluation to them sometimes that uh, once we've defined them by our terms, we write them off. And that's one of the things that's going on around us in this Christian nation let alone the rest of the world. And I don't think that's going to let up. Not in our lifetime. I doubt it very much. I think it's going to continue. And, and so there is this rejection of God that's going on, which is no excuse to us to serve God, because we're not, we're not doing it for on the basis of success or failure in the world. We're doing it because we're doing it for God. And, uh, and, you know, when we find success in, in our understanding of the term, we rejoice for sure. And that is a joyful thing. But um, our real joy comes in being faithful to the service to which we have been called in whatever way, uh, you know, we are able and called to do it. I have a, a reading I want to read to you. This is actually a comment from... Uh, from Gandhi. And, you know, his concept of salvation uh, would have been probably very different than ours. It's interesting to note that one of the things that Gandhi said once was that the message of Christianity was so great and so wonderful that if you'd ever met someone that he thought was a real Christian, he would change and become a Christian. Um, so, uh, you know, it, there's an awful lot of judgment in that. And, uh, and, and the fact of the matter is that we're still human beings and we don't live up to the fullness of the, of the claim. But um, anyway, so um, Gandhi uh, said this, If 
When we plunge our hand into a bowl of water or stir up the fire with the bellows or tabulate interminable columns of figures in our bookkeeping table or burnt by the sun we are plunged in the mud of the rice field or standing by the smelter's furnace, go back to the if, if we do not fulfill the same religious life as if in prayer in a monastery, the world will never be saved. And, uh, and I thought, what a, what a message for Christianity. You know, if, if in everything we do, we don't fulfill the same religious life, and we don't like the term religious, but it, it's, it's a good term. It is a good term. It, is a, it, is a, it, it implies a focus uh, toward the God of the religion that you claim. And I'm not talking about United Methodism or Baptist or Roman Catholic, or I'm talking about the, uh, a Christian faith here, okay, where Jesus is Lord and a Trinitarian faith. And those are two of the key elements, you know, and one of the things that we're told is if you uh, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There are some bottom line things. And, uh, and so don't get put off by that word religious, but if whenever we do whatever we do, we don't fulfill the same religious life as if in prayer in a monastery, the world will never be saved. And uh, I thought, what a powerful statement that is. It really, it really says so very much to us. Um, God has called you. God will enable you. And God will share with you the joy of his kingdom. And uh, that's where our focus needs to constantly be. And if it is, uh, then we will share in the joy. And, uh, and perhaps sometimes even in the frustration. But we'll do it because we're doing it for the Lord. And so, may grace, mercy, love, and peace flow through your life and your ministry all the day long. Amen. The church for others and for you. Blessings on you. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.